We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. The one-two pitch. Ball line to Yount. It's short. He throws. It's over. The Brewers have won the American League pennant. Milwaukee, you have a World Series. Hit in the air. Yount. Makes a great catch, and Juan Diemus has thrown the first no-hitter in Milwaukee Brewer history. Swings, and here it is! A base hit in the right center. He's done it. 3,000 for Robin. And there's a drive in the left field. This is hit well. Gonna smash up the middle, base hit the center. Here comes Gomez around third. A throw, and the Brewers win. The Brewers are moving on on a base hit by Nigel Morgan. Here it is. Yelich sends one to right center and deep. Get up, get up, get out of here and go for Yelich. You're cruising for a bruising with me, Andrew Snyder. And me. Adam McGee. As we talk all things Milwaukee Brewers for the Eurostep Podcast Network and Blue Wire Podcast. Adam, if you're considering the Major League Baseball season like a 12-round boxing match, uh, you know, boxing matches go through stages. We've seen the Brewers hand out punches and knock out blows, sweeping the Mets, sweeping the Cardinals. And what we've seen this week, Adam, I'm going to say it, the Brewers know how to take a punch and get back up. Uh, that was definitely the theme of this week as they split uh, a four-game series with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, faced with all kinds of adversity both on the field and off the field and on the field before games and batting practice. But we'll get to all that. Uh, how you doing, Adam? I'm glad to talk to you after uh, a series salvaged. I'm doing well. Yeah, this is kind of a... Let's keep the good vibes going, and that's you lose the first two. That's not what you want, but when you show that you can bounce back and get a split on the road in the vision, kind of end what has been a very, very heavy road, heavy stretch of your schedule overall. There has been some breaks in there, but we talked about in the last episode. Uh, the Brewers have overall kind of been living out there on the road. 16 road games as, as opposed to 8 home games so far on the season. Um, so, a bit of a homestand coming up. That'll be nice. And yeah, good to see some resilience. The lineup is looking, you know, not true choice or by design. As I mentioned to you earlier, today I really got whiffs of, oh god, this is like last year's lineup. There are multiple guys in this lineup who can't really hit or in deep, deep funks. That wasn't the case early in the season with the mix of players available to Murph. Um, But hey, they still find ways to get it done. They still find ways to pick up wins, and if they can continue to be that team, I mean, it's going to be A-OK. It's going to be a pretty good season. Yeah, uh, I think it was game three uh, due to the left-handed opener that the Pirates threw out there. We got three-hitter Owen Miller. Uh, got his one at bat in there. Then as soon as there was a righty in the game, in went Jake Bowers. <laughs> so, yeah, the lineup's definitely looking funky uh, as they try to make do without, namely, Christian Yelich. Uh, uh, this lineup 
looks a whole lot better when he's in the middle of it, especially mm -hmm. performing the way, the way that he did to start this season. And um, no real status updates, I think, on that. Um, so we, we still wait to see when he will return. But if we want to talk about some other uh, injury news, we can do that. And as I mentioned, uh, since last time we podcasted, Jake Bowers is back with the team reinstated from the bereavement list. Andrew Monasterio back to AAA Nashville. The bad news, uh, Wade Miley placed on the 15-day IL retroactive to April 19th with left elbow inflammation. Uh, Sophia Minert gave an update uh, the other day um, since that first news and that his uh, MRI was inconclusive. Traveled to Cincinnati to had an, have an arthrogram done for more imaging on his elbow. Um, Tobias Myers called up to replace him from Nashville. Myers got a start in the series, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But... Tough to see out of Wade. Um, for just sorry that it's for Wade that he's having to go through this again. But it's one of the things that we talked about could be what his season looks like. Um, he's talked earlier in the week about how he's like dealt with things like bone spurs and inflammation uh, in the past in that elbow, but he just wasn't recovering between throwing uh, the way that he wanted to. So obviously, in his last start, he had that incident where he got hit in the knee, and now dealing with that. Elbow inflammation puts the Brewers in a bind where they need to get starts out of uh, guys that maybe six weeks ago we did not think would be factoring into the starting rotation. Yeah, and I, I don't know. What was your reaction in a good sense to the inconclusive nature of the... I, maybe that should Bad. make us feel better, <laughs> but also it really doesn't. Um. Is that just that we'd prefer a bullet to the head? I don't know, but well, here's the thing. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about another injury as well as we have this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, because because Pat Murphy and talking to the media, I think it was on Wednesday, or it was either Wednesday or Tuesday, talked about DL Hall having a tear in his MCL, so he's got that sprained knee, and obviously the initial reports were that he heard it on the bunt play in his last start, uh. That inferred that he had been dealing with the injury leading up to that, and that was just the the straw that broke the camel's back where he finally told somebody. So if there's a why behind an injury and you can say, okay, this poor performance was probably because he was dealing with something he wasn't talking about. Whereas with Blade Miley's situation, you're telling me it feels different and you don't know what's going on, and the MRI did not provide a why. It's like you said, could be comforting in the sense that we don't know it's definitively something bad that's going to take him away for a long time. But the not knowing is its own kind of box of scary for me. Could be, you know, that he's old. Yeah. And his body's sort of being like, mm, yeah, this is uh this has been quite a lot of this over the years. I don't know. I, I really hope we're not looking at him. This is where we need to on like that. I don't even know he can help with an inconclusive MRI. Um, if he would tell me what an arthrogram is, that'd be great, though. <laughs> that's I don't. I guess it's I, I. I was gonna make a guess. I was gonna make a guess that may, may have been informed on language, but listen, I'm not a doctor, so I'll leave that to the doctors. I I think it's a tough spot they're in. The DL Hall one is weird with. Murph kind of in a response to a question laying it out there rather than you know, you know jarring his knee and th that he may have a tear in his MCL um, this is our DL Hall that's that seems like a big deal and I don't know was he just not talking about that at all it may feel make us feel much better <laughs> about D.L. Hall in the long run, although I don't know if a MCL injury generally should do that. Um, but at the same time, my guy, if you're dealing with that and that kind of pain, you should have told someone quite a while ago and not just be like, this is my opportunity to be a starter, a new team, I want to get out there, get things off on the right foot. It's like, you should have made sure you got healthy. Um, it's it's tough. Look, we haven't even, we're like, this isn't even getting into the, the latest, you know, Brewers freak injury of it all. Um, but the Brewers pitching staff is 
in a pretty grim place with injuries right now and they're being stretched in a way that they can't really afford to and you know what still this series the pitching was pretty good um and they're getting good pitching now from new sources that we weren't necessarily expecting not long ago um honestly robert gaster's next start could be with the brewers and if not based on pat murphy's quotes it certainly seems like at most, they're probably going to give him one more with the sounds, and then he'll be he'll be up to start with the Brewers. So, like, they might just continue to find ways to work through this and to get it done, and in the process, maybe they find some other things. Like, I don't know, Bryce Wilson could be more of a starter for Pat Murphy and how he's looking at things now. Um, Myers, who we will talk about and after his debut and what a kind of weird and incredible journey he's had to this point. Maybe he holds up and pitches well like he did in his first start and becomes a you know credible rotation piece as the year goes on. And maybe Robert Gasser comes up and delivers in the way that we've been hoping for, you know, a year plus now that he eventually would as a brewer. So they're both like completely obliterated in a pitching sense in terms of what we were planning for not long ago, and yet Credit to the Brewers, credit to their development, credit to the Flyers that they've kind of taken chances on and had in the system, and they might just be able to get through this, or at least able to do kind of what we saw in this series. Like if this series is a microcosm of what they can do going forward, overall, like we'll be we'll be pretty happy if you can get your outs and kind of hold good solid starts together. Like this series was less problematic in terms of overworking the bullpen too and some of the recent series have been in spite of the fact your rotation has taken a big hit and we didn't know who was going to start really until you know day of in three of the games you do mention gasser um in his debut uh four innings um one run four hits a walk five strikeouts 49 pitches started the game six up six down um fastball up to 95 uh also did it at like 10 in the morning because it was an education uh, day game. So like good on him. I'm usually getting my like fourth cup of coffee to um, take a meeting with some idiot and he's able to go out there and uh, make his first start of the season. Um, so good for him. Uh, one injury that I don't think you mentioned, Adam is uh, Jacob Junis. I alluded to it. I, <laughs> okay. can, it. It needs its own, you know, devoted segment to join, you know, McGill falling in a phone store and banging his head, ready to let's, you know, losing a fingernail. Um, what else am I forgetting from last year? What was the other crazy one? I don't know. It's just it's an ongoing thing. Yeah. Uh so this is a statement that the Brewers put out after the incident. Uh writers, I think Kurt Hogue was the one that tweeted this, said they had just walked out of media availability with Murphy, where I think he had provided the Wade Miley update. Uh, and they had talked to Miley, I think, earlier in the day or however that was doing. And then Jacob Junis hit in the neck by a batted ball during betting pra- or batting practice. He is conscious, alert, and responsive. He was sent to the hospital for further evaluation. Uh, Sophia Minert reported on the 24th that he was back in the clubhouse um, and also saw that they were kind of monitoring him for concussion symptoms. But just any injury that is possible will happen to a Milwaukee Brewer. I mean, it, it, it's, it's getting, it's getting crazy at this point. Uh, I'm trying not to curse with like everything I was just sending in all of our chats as we were talking about what kind of pitching uh, rotation they can line up and how can they manage till somebody's back and this and that. And Junis already dealing uh, with that shoulder injury on the IL and they can't catch a break. I'm thinking, can they have like, um, Robots with like AI generated uh, motion with like gloves uh, attached to like segways just run around in batting practice to catch the ball so we don't have to put actual players out there. I don't I don't know uh, what the answer is, but uh, ban batting practice. <laughs> I like it. It really it's beyond the farce. I mean, did, you are going to be much better positioned to have a census than me. Does this stuff happen to other teams all the time? 
<laughs> over the I'm course sure it of does, the season. I'm just is not... there is there a significant enough share? Like, are we just seeing guys at injury reports when a different team rolls into town or the Brewers go see them and we don't realize that, oh, you know, this guy uh, slipped going down the stairs and, like, I don't know, cracked his hip and this guy, you know, I don't know, fell and, I don't know, chipped his front tooth, you know, coming out of the dugout. I don't know. It's just the Brewers find what well, feel like wild and unique ways to... uh to get injured but maybe it's just maybe baseball is dangerous uh yeah i'm sure there are situations where it clusters like that um but i just can't think of one in 32 years of watching baseball where a team that i was following on a day-to-day basis just had as many of these types of injuries happen within a year span and then you go back to the lucroy suitcase thing but you know Pre cruising yeah. for a bruising, like it just uh, just seems to be one of those random things in life that uh, confounds you. I think that was all the updates that we have. Anything else going on around so, Brewer? Honestly, it's terms? enough. I would like if we could just not start every episode with a list that's like three to four players long of injuries. Yeah, if we could just have like a 30 minute podcast on Sunday night or Monday morning where it's like, yep, they beat the Yankees 10 0 in every game. Here's how they scored. Like, it was beautiful. Um, but that's that's not the life we get to live. We live the life given to us. We don't get to choose it. Um, game one of this series on Monday Pirates versus the Brewers, Joe Ross on the Hill against Jared Jones. I've been hearing a lot of uh, chatter about Jared Jones on uh, the national podcast, hearing about that. Uh, fastball velocity, the induced vertical break, and uh, how he was just tying uh, batters in knots. But I had not seen it for myself just yet. And uh, yeah, Jared Jones is what he was described as by all the national media pundits and, and bloggers on the various podcasts that pass through my earwaves on a weekly basis. Um, Joe Ross, to his credit, uh, matched him about as well as he could in terms of run prevention. Uh, but the uh, Pirates would score run immediately in the bottom half of the, f- of the first. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon at the plate. First pitch homer to center, was it, Adam? I think you had a first pitch. Uh, a, stat, a stat on that or memory uh, from the early days of this podcast uh, about Andrew McCutcheon. Yeah, it was a memory that I just went and double checked because I was like, I feel like I remember talking about it. It was the first time. Um, It was what? Like a month, if not even, because we started the season late into the first season of this podcast back in 2022. And it was the first time that I had seen a first pitch home run. And it was from Andrew McCutcheon. And it was against the Pirates in Pittsburgh. So, I mean, it's not a secret, the connection that Andrew McCutcheon has to Pittsburgh and to this particular park. Um, I... But yeah, that's that's three games I have watched him involved in. Um, featuring the Pirates and the Brewers in the last two years where he has hit a first pitch home run. That seems pretty remarkable. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Craig is usually a fan of water cooler talk. But it's draft season, and that's all anyone wants to talk about. The Athletic has loads of articles about this year's draft, but Greg doesn't have The Athletic, so now he's filling up his water bottle in the bathroom sink, which 
to remind you is the sink people use after they use the bathroom. Get the athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Andrew McCutcheon, uh, still going out and doing it. And uh, at a certain point during this week, I I wondered if they had moved the furry convention up earlier uh, in the calendar. And, and that's what was giving him uh, his strength. But I think it's just, you know, Kutch still having a little bit left in the tank. And honestly, good for him in what times when it doesn't affect the Brewers. Um, but yeah, Jared Jones just mowing down uh, Brewers until the fifth inning uh, when Reese Hoskins would hit, crush a homer to left center field. Uh, Blake Perkins would walk, but then that would be all that would happen in the fifth for the Brewers. Uh, Joe Ross, a scoreless bottom of the fifth. Uh, a nice double play turned to help him out in that inning as well. Jared Jones um, in the sixth uh, gets into a little bit of trouble, uh, gets free licked to ground out. Uh, William Contreras single puts a runner on after an Adamas fly out. Uh, a Jake Bowers double gets Contreras to third. Uh, Reese Hoskins walks, and then Blake Perkins hits a comebacker back to Jones. Um, and that would be all for Jared Jones. Six innings pitch, four hits, just the one run on the Hoskins homer, two walks, seven strikeouts. Good performance from him. I mean, if you're a Pirates fan, imagining him, Skeens, as the future of your rotation is a pretty exciting uh, proclamation now. They got Mitch Keller signed to that extension as well. He did not pitch as well as <laughs> some of the other guys in the series. But, uh, yeah, impressive stuff from Jared Jones. I mean, you're hoping for a Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff type of one-two punch if you're the Pirates, and that seems honestly very, very plausible. Um, to just zero in a little bit more on Jared Jones, he uh caught Bryce Terang for what will probably be the nastiest sword of the season in the third inning, where he just, I mean, unleashed one of the most wicked sliders I've ever seen, and plenty of Brewers have very wicked sliders. Um, but yeah, That's foreshadowing. He forced he forced Bryce into a a really quite comical slip, which I mean even had Bryce laughing when he when he got back up. But that was just that was nasty. And you know, last season's Bryce Tarang, I would have said, yeah, he's definitely gonna end up looking really really silly and trying to make contact with a pitch. And not so much this season's Bryce. So that's uh, it shows just how good Jerry Jones stuff is. And that was a, a hell of a pitch. All you can do is laugh. So that's the appropriate response from Bryce there. Uh, I hated that it was done to my guy, Bryce Terang, mm-hmm. but the pitching ninja uh, gif of his soul leaving his body um, was objectively a humorous bit of visual comedy. Um, this game would kind of hinge on some things that happened in the bottom of the sixth inning. Joe Ross still on the mound for the Brewers, gets a Brian Reynolds ground out to first uh, after a kid Brian Hayes um, infield single to third. Uh, Pat Murphy comes and gets uh, Ross from the game, just 79 pitches thrown. Brings in Hobie Milner with originally Rowdy Telez and Jack Sawinski due to hit. The uh, Pirates would counter by um, pinch hitting Connor Joe for Rowdy. Connor Joe hits a single to right field. That puts runners on first and second with that one out. Um, and then a Jack Sawinski ground ball to first base, uh, Jake Bowers going to his right fields, the ball, and then has just a very bad backhand flip to Hobie Milner, trying to cover the bag error allows a run to score, puts runners on first and second with one out, um, two, one pirates at that point after a Michael a Taylor, uh, sacrifice, uh, O'Neill Cruz comes to the plate, um, and singles to left to score Joe and Sawinski makes it 4-1. Uh, Henry Davis then walked. Thiago Vieira has to come on to get out of the inning. He strikes out Williams. And it's 4-1 Pirates at that point. But yeah, all all kind of goes awry on that inning. Uh, and the backhand flip being the uh, butterfly fl- effect moment uh, for the Brewers. Yeah, I mean, we we should probably... We've talked a bit about the, the bullpen and... Pat Murphy's management of it in recent episodes, so we probably should zero in on the decision to pull Joe Ross after five and a third. Um, it's probably, I mean, it may be the most interesting moment of the series from a conversation standpoint in terms of trying to work out who the Brewers are, who Pat Murphy is as manager, and what we're going to see, particularly with the kind of mix of pitchers that they're working with. Um, I was watching this 
live at the time. And I was very, very surprised um, that Ross was not allowed to stay in the game. I believe he had just allowed the a runner at the first base. Um, but I would I would have very much said he's only trying 79 pitches, he's pitched very, very well, managed his way through the game exceptionally well. Leave him out there, he's gonna get you out of the inning and get you six. Um, post game, what Pat Murphy really kind of used to explain the decision was. Um, essentially that the stuff just wasn't looking to be what it was. Um, yeah, the sinker was they flattening felt, out. They felt the sinker was flattening out and kind of implying that this is something that they've seen with Ross towards this point in game so far this season. Um, Joe Ross was kind of asked about it. He seemed to be a little bit puzzled at why he was taken out. He felt good. He felt his velocity was good. Matthew Trueblood, a Brewer fanatic, did a really, really good piece on this, basically examining Pat Murphy's claims and trying to get the bottom wall. Is it true? You know, um, and the bottom line is it is true. Not only does his sinker, and I mean, just generally, do we see the horizontal break in his pitches really, really drop off as he gets to that point in the game, but it is a really stark drop in his velocity too. Um, In that regard, it's really tough to make an argument that Pat Murphy made the wrong call. But sometimes, sometimes, Andrew, calling it old-fashioned, um, Guys can just get out and find our way out of a situation and you need two more outs that could be two pitches that go your way. And it's really, it is the chain of events. It's knowing that, okay, you bring Hobie Milner in, Rowdy Telez, who I love the big guy. He's, he really doesn't have it right now. He was immediately going to get pulled and pinch hit and Connor Joe comes in and does damage and really sets off a series of events that lead to the Brewers' downfall in the game. Um, I really we've no way known for sure. Maybe just the process being right is going to lead you to more wins over the course of the season than anything else. But I I do think he could have left Joe Ross in, and they they may well have got out of that in in better place. It's an interesting and revealing thing though to like we talked about Murph as he was like this openly, like he seems like this gruff old fashioned baseball figure. Um, but he is also someone who's very, very clearly locked in and listening to what they're seeing from a data perspective. Um, which I mean, honestly, how many managers can stick around in today's game? if they're, they're not kind of that level of reactive, but it is instructive, I think, to getting a sense of Murph and maybe something that can tell us more about some of the other bullpen decisions that don't always necessarily feel right in the moment, but maybe in a by-the-book sense, right, that the Brewers feel very comfortable with is going to be more beneficial to them over the course of an 162-game season. Yeah, so that uh, at that point in the game, that was when. So I was at a hockey game. You were been watching on my on my phone up until literally that point, and that's when I, you know, got to close to puck drop and kind of had to log off and like enjoy the world in front of me instead of being all consumed by the Brewers Andrews, on my phone. For anyone who doesn't know, Andrew's team are in the playoffs and they are very good. So we're you're allowed you're allowed to have a good team in the playoffs. You deserve it. That being that being said, I. had... I had taped the game, and I went okay, back and watched from that point. Uh, up at an hour way later than I should have been on a work night, um, and seeing it live, I kind of came down to the same conclusion as you. Then I saw the post game media availability, and then I read the article the next day, and I I think the kind of candor that we get from Murph that we'll probably talk about a little bit later as well. As a fan, honestly helps you kind of process that decision making and I can't fault his process one bit there. Now, now this is going to sound bad. I if this is a playoff game, 
I'm 100% bringing in Hobie Milner in that situation and seeing like what plays out. If I'm trying to kind of get away with getting Joe Ross two more outs in that inning so that I can use one less guy in that game for my pin. Yeah, a period every reliever saved matters to this team. I, so I might risk it and do it that way because there's two elements of risk at play here. Sinker's flattening out. Rowdy breaks out of a slump, hits one into the Allegheny, and we're saying, why didn't he pull Ross? And there's the other thing where um, he, you take Rowdy out of the game. He's swinging a wet newspaper right now. Maybe I want him at the plate. Um, mm-hmm. And now he's gone and Connor Joe gets a base hit. And the the whole other thing is if Jake Bowers doesn't make that error, what happens? Uh, maybe sure. O'Neill Cruz doesn't even hit. Um and also, you got to score more than two runs in a baseball game uh, if you're going to win. Jared Jones just went out and beat you, and you had to be perfect to to kind of outlast him. So, yeah, it's in the moment. And, and watching it when I got home, I was kind of like, oh, I wish you would have just left Ross in there. But I, I can't fault it either. I think this is one of those uh, win-win, no-win situations because the result is going to live in your mind more than the process, even though the process was really sound. Um, and... Yeah, there's some. I think this series ultimately was a series where he played the bullpen usage about the way he had to, especially in games uh, three and four, which were wins. Um, but yeah, just fascinating to have a manager that will tell you why he did something instead of just give you word salad answers that really tell you nothing. I, I think Ugh. at some at some point though, with that like. I, I would have certain games where I would go full Han Solo and be like, never tell me the odds, you know? And yeah, I, I think there are times where, okay, could this go wrong? Are you telling me it's more likely than not this could go wrong? It would still be so and... much better. And the net gain we could get out of if it doesn't go wrong is so significant that I'm going to go that way. Um And... <laughs> I th- um, we're not talking about pushing Joe Ross too much further. I don't think it's real concern. I I don't. I just I would have liked to see it. And if it if it goes that way, I think that's that's fine too. Your point is entirely valid. Um, as if Jake Bowers and Hobie Milner connect on on that play, well, this is probably a moot point, and everyone comes out of it even better. We don't even think about it in our head. We're like, yeah, Joe Ross probably would have gone and done that, and that's great for him, and Pat Murphy gets to kind of bask in the glow of the right decision, too. But, yeah, look, it's just an interesting one. We will return to his candor, because not only do I think it's... Not only do I think it's really, really interesting and says a lot about Murph as a person and as a baseball manager, I think it's going to make all Brewers fans who are listening to him night tonight just smarter over the course of the season. It's really rare in sports to have a coach who just literally will pull back, you know, the curtain and be like, "Yeah, here, here's, here's exactly what I was thinking there. Here's exactly what we were trying to do there." And um, that seems to be his whole philosophy, game to game, and it's. It's leading to good results on the field, and it's very, very refreshing and engaging as a fan. Absolutely. I also want to say, as we talk about Ross getting taken out of this game with the sinker flattening out, I remain just encouraged about his inclusion in Agree. this ro- rotation and to be a guy that, that can be counted on. Five and a third uh, innings pitched, uh, just the one run that was attributed to him. Six hits, uh, a walk, four strikeouts. I mean, he's like, excuse me, God, I, I apologize, Adam. Um, with Ross going into the season, we would have thought that, like, okay, best case scenario about your role on this team uh, is you're the fifth starter, and like you're you're the last guy in the rotation, and you're just you're just there. Um, and I guess depending on how you uh, map out the rotation, he may be higher than that now because of the injuries and the way things have gone, but getting a four Oh five ERA through the first 20 innings from your five starter is something that you can most certainly live with. And it are innings that really help you. And so good stuff from Ross and we'll see what ha- happens next game. We'll see if uh, he continues to, to pitch. Well, he's had, he's had the bad games, the game where he kind of got death by a thousand paper cuts on uh, balls, finding uh, grass and, a lot of bad luck there, the though. I, 
I, I think even And that, he's... he gets something of a pass on. I think he's been much, much better than he's been bad, if that makes sense. Yeah, and the first game that I was at where the walks were really getting him down, he wasn't locating the four-seam fastball. Today, just or this game, just one walk. So when he's limiting that and going out and pitching into the sixth inning, um, that's good stuff for a team that <laughs> keeps losing pitchers. Uh, the Brewers would... Uh, Get some good relief from Chiago Rivera after um, after relieving Hobie Milner of his duties there. Then they would uh, put some runners on against Aroldis Chapman, which would be a theme. Um, after a William Contreras and Willie Adamas walk, uh, Gary Sanchez would pinch hit for Jake Bowers, who would also draw a walk. That loaded the bases. Uh, Owen Miller then uh, gets the pinch run for Sanchez. Uh, Reese Hoskins grounds out to third it scores Contreras and then Blake Perkins grounds out unable to t capitalize on that a situation with the bases loaded and just one out uh Vieira comes in pitches a scoreless eight for the Brewers and then David Bednar on in the ninth for the Pirates um after a terrain fly out to center Jackson Shorty reaches on an infield single Joey Ortiz flies out to white Oliver Dunn uh pinch hits for Joey Weimer strikes out swinging Brewers lose 4-2 um mostly due to uh Jared Jones just being really nasty and good work from Colin Holderman from the Pirates as well, and uh, David Bednar, who uh, Rowdy told Pirates fans to be nice to, um, nails down the save. Uh, moving on to the next game of this series, and this game saw the debut of Tobias Minor or Myers, excuse me, a guy who had a pretty arduous minor league journey to to get to where um, he's gotten to today, and I think that you can see across various. Uh, Brewers bloggers and some minor league baseball bloggers in general about uh, Tobias Myers fastball and some of the life on that up to 95 and ability to hold that velocity and fastball shape deep into games, which is kind of what has attributed to his rise and him being a guy that they can have in a next man up situation from Nashville. Uh, first pitch of this game as well, Andrew McCutcheon, homer to left. This one was like directly down the left field line. The MLB debut for Myers got the jitters out early by allowing that uh, homer. But, uh, yeah, this was the point where I was like, Kutch, are the furries in town? <laughs> that could also easily, I don't know what the actual distance was, but it was very close to going foul. And if it had gone foul, you look at Tobias Myers' first outing, like, all the more impressive again. But, yeah, what, what a rude way for a veteran like Andrew McCutcheon to greet Tobias Myers on his, his introduction to the big leagues. It was rude. Adam, I'm glad you said that. Uh, Myers' first part overall, really good. Five innings pitch, four hits, one run. Uh, it was earned, uh, obviously, on the homer, well, one walk and four strikeouts. Uh, just great to see for his debut. Obviously, looks like he's going to get another turn in the rotation um, because they need him, and uh, I'm encouraged. Uh, as well, uh, I think uh, maybe I, I I I felt like he could have gone deeper into this game. I know why they didn't because I think he had pitched maybe over the weekend in, in relief, and it wasn't necessarily lining up with his rest. And you probably, especially with a rookie and the journey, yeah, saying, just don't push him to get here. You want to end on a strong suit, but the the way he finished was really strong. Two strikeouts in that fifth inning to to get out of things. I I, I was really impressed with Meyer. He, he looked great. I mean, some really nice pitches. He, he had a really nasty low curveball that made Rowdy look really, really stupid as well. Um, Yeah, I, I like the stuff. I liked how he handled it out there. We would have seen lesser pitchers, and I think we may we may have seen lesser pitchers um, over the time doing the podcast kind of have something happen to them early like that, Andrew McCutcheon. When you think of you're making your debut and your first pitch is a home run, you could really, if you're not the guy at all, you would crumble, like, and you're out of there in no time and the team have lost the game. So the fact that he just shook that off and he said, yeah, okay, you got me there, but that's it for today. Super, super impressive. I'm very excited to see him again. There's no guarantee that holds up. There's no guarantee he's going to be a factor around the course of the season. Um, but wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be great if he does do it again? If it does prove to be something real? They're the kind of success stories and the finds that you kind of need. And I think right now the Brewers really need. In the sixth, Jared Koenig would relieve uh, Myers. Uh, Brian Reynolds ground ball single to right that honestly I think 
Jake Bowers probably makes that play. So a little bit of tough luck there. Uh, Brian Hayes, single, puts runners on first and second. Connor Joe, pinch hits for Rowdy Telez. Joe singles to score Brian Reynolds, makes it 2 nothing. He would have uh, Annie would then get Jack Sawinski to line out to center, Triolo to line out to center, and then a uh, grounded out by O'Neill Cruz um, would end the threat there. Uh, for the Pirates, a guy who's not necessarily at the top of my list when I'm thinking of Pirates uh, pitchers, Bailey Falter was great uh, in this game for the Pirates. Seven innings, three hits, just the one run that we'll get to in a moment. Uh, two walks and eight strikeouts. Uh, another Brewer Fanatic article earlier in the week, I can't remember who wrote it, was talking about uh, Jackson Shorio being attacked away with the uh, sweepers and sliders, and that had been what had kind of been making him uh, look foolish uh, over the uh, brief uh, troubles in his major league career. Falter attacked him up in the zone with that 92 to 93 mile an hour fastball uh, that I think has great ride, if I'm remembering uh, what was being discussed on the broadcast as well. So got him up in the zone, three strikeouts on the day for Chorio um, and Falter. Uh, 92, 93 on the fastball, but it plays faster, and it seemed to be, once again, um, befuddling Brewers hitters. Just three hits in this game for the Brewers. Uh, they would get a run in the eighth on a Gary Sanchez uh, home run to left field. Uh, that would be it for Falter. Colin Holderman comes on, uh, gets out of the eighth, and then uh, after a scoreless Admiral Rebe bottom of the eighth, David Bednar comes on for the second straight night and closes things down, gets an Adama strikeout, Hoskins ground out, Perkins ground out, Brewers lose 2-1, uh, dominated again by an impressive pitching performance. Yeah, just an offensive stinker. Not a good game overall, really, to watch. Pretty pretty rough stuff. Um, we'll talk a little bit more on this later, but Gary Sanchez is a dude. Um, he very much is the guy that I think we thought and hoped he would be when they signed him. Um, his his numbers overall may not look pretty by the end of the season, except for home runs, which will look really, really great. This was an absolute tank, 432 feet, um, over 114 mile per hour exit velocity, one of two Brewers homers in this season to to go 114. Um yeah, I I really like watching him just absolutely crush baseballs. So much, Sandro. My concern is, is he gonna hit one of these balls so far that the baseball just splits in two off the off the bat, doesn't go anywhere? Is this a thing that happens? Um, what, he's what gonna hit the guts out scenario? of the ball, like um, in the same lot. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it seems it seems like it could be in play. My one other thing I'll note, just because you mentioned Connor Joe, we mentioned the game before. The thing about the Pirates and the thing about splitting a series with the Pirates, the Pirates have multiple guys on the roster that I do not like seeing, you know, as a Brewers fan because they've had moments like you look at what Kutch did in this series. Obviously, O'Neill Cruz has marked out his credentials in the past as a Brewers killer. Um, Swinski has in the past and in, although he's not really playing all that well at the moment he did come up with hits I think in three or four games in this series and indeed Connor Joe too um, delivered some some big moments that's not even getting to Reynolds or kind of opening up you know the potential for others to join a Brewers killer kind of list as the year goes on but there are a number of guys as much as we may look at the Pirates and place them in a certain category there are a number of guys on that roster who are Brewers killers or adjacent to Brewers killers, which, you know, a series against them just feels tough for that reason. There's a lot of guys you just don't want to see taking ABs against the Brewers. Yeah, the disconnect in my brain between what I view O'Neill Cruz as and what his general performance was in his rookie year and obviously got hurt last year and how he's been performing this year. It's just... Night and day because he's not connect think... with, with Ellie Dela Cruz in our brains, right? It's yeah, like that's exactly. that's the kind of guy he is. Um he, look, he should be. I'll never I'll never understand every time I'm like, oh really, that's what his numbers are overall, because he just seems to have all the tools. And when he sees Milwaukee Brewers logo, he knows how to put it all together. Yeah, it's like it's it's clearly just something within him just snaps and he's like, I must destroy the starting pitcher with the the beautiful logo on their hat. Uh, moving on to game three of the series, as we mentioned, Bryce Wilson 
getting the start um, for the Brewers as they end up with this starting pitcher crunch. On the other side for the Pirates, like I mentioned earlier, they went with um, an opener in Josh Fleming, uh, former Durham Bull. So shout out, shout out, Josh. Um, I, I, I don't know how good you are, but you did your job in this series. Uh, but the Brewers would end up scoring uh, first in this game. Top of the third, Fleming still pitching. Um, Sal Freelich reaches first on a throwing error by old friend Rowdy Telez. After Jackson Chorio strikeout swing, Bryce Terang would draw a walk. Luis Ortiz then comes in for Pittsburgh. Uh, William Contreras singles the center to score Sal Freelich. Makes it one to nothing. Um, Jake Bowers then pinch hits for Owen Miller. Strikes out. Uh, Reese Hoskins gets hit by a pitch to bring a run in. Bryce Terang scored on that. That made it two nothing. That would look painful. That was kind of like the mm. was it like the his right forearm like that. That made me kind of like jump back in my in my uh, living room. But uh, brought the run home <laughs> by any means necessary. Blake Perkins then draws a bases loaded walk of his own to make it three nothing. Uh, Bryce Wilson would get into his first real bit of trouble in the bottom of the third. After striking out Henry Davis, Connor Joe would draw a walk, and then Brian Reynolds crushes a homer to right center, scoring himself and uh, Joe making it three to two. Brewers still in the lead. Um, overall, good performance for Bryce Wilson. Brian Reynolds, you can add him to that list of Brewers killers. Uh, they were talking some sort of stat about the homers against the Brewers that he said on the broadcast. Although he he would he would give a little back with his glove later. More on that uh, later in the series. More on that in a minute. Um, yeah, four and a third innings pitched for Bryce uh, Wilson in this game. Three hits, two runs, three walks, three strikeouts, the homer. So worked around some traffic to get into the fifth inning. Um, Pat Murphy alluded to in the post game that we could be seeing more of Bryce Wilson in the rotation, and we already know we're going to see him probably down the line um, next week. But uh It'll be inter- interesting to see if this is something he can do, pitch deeper into games, even if he's just a five-and-dive guy. I think uh, that's something that can be tenable for a few weeks until he maybe slides back into that uh, middle-of-the-game multi-inning relief role. For sure. I think it's it's the length that's most impressive here. There's a sound bite for anyone if they ever want it. Um, but seeing him go 75 pitches – you can see a version of Bryce Wilson that, yeah, in the day where his stuff is a little bit more dialed in, you're going to get your true five innings. You might get your true six innings. Um, Look, I think there's a real fondness in, in these parts here, a cruising for a bruising for Bryce Wilson, particularly when it comes to you. But I think part of it is like he's just like the ultimate yeoman. It's like, what do I need to do today? And he really has had to do a little bit of everything. Um, in his time with the Brewers, and he's always shows himself to be up to the task. Um, I I know we would not be praising really almost any other pitcher for giving up two earned runs in four and a third innings, but I really did think this was quite good, and I think it it wasn't Bryce with his best stuff. But he battled and he's a pro and he gets you to a place where guess what? You're in a game and you got a chance to win. And if you're that's I mean, maybe one of the key differences between being a starter and a reliever. A reliever, you're out there and you know, someone else has already put you in a place in a game, and your job is to just go out there and, you know, really put up zeros. Um, as a starter, you gotta carry things and it's it's about giving the team the chance to win. It's about handing the ball over to the bullpen and them having a chance to close it out. That's what he did. That's what he did. He built a platform for the Brewers to go and get the win that they did. Um, and considering they lost the first two games of the series, like he could easily come out of there, struggled, not having his best stuff, and this game gets away too, and it becomes a, a very different proposition. So a lot of respect and a big shout-out to Bryce Wilson for battling through that and making sure the Brewers were in position. In position, they were. Uh, Brian Hudson came on in relief for Wilson. Brian Hudson, again, excellent. One and two-thirds innings pitch. Uh, just the one hit allowed uh, and one strike out there. A 0.68 ERA to start the year for Brian Hudson, a guy that they obviously picked up in an offseason trade. Um, and 
it has worked out tremendously thus far, turning into a vital part of the bullpen um, as we were updating our master brewer leaderboard, which we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, we commented on how high uh, Hudson was on the board, but uh, it can't help it with how good he's been over the first 13 and a third innings in his brewer's career. Elvis Pagaro comes on in relief of Hudson, throws a scoreless inning, uh, works around a walk with a strikeout, uh, to get through there, Trevor McGill comes on and throws a scoreless eighth with a strikeout. And then uh, Yoel Piomps uh, would come on in the ninth inning. Things would uh, get a little hairy there, Adam. Um, and there's a play that we didn't talk about earlier that you can talk about. I was, was going to circle. Uh, okay, we're good. We yeah. Uh, yeah, I was trying to <laughs> get us up to this point as well because it's part of the equation here. Uh, but uh, Yoel Piomps on the mound strikes out Jack Sawinski to start the inning. Uh Olivares reaches first on a fielding error by Piamps in a place that play that was pretty close. Um, but ultimately he would reach base. Michael A. Taylor comes on to run. Uh O'Neill Cruz then is safe on a drop fly ball from Joey Weimer. Weimer charging in, Willie Adamas charging back. A uh, little bit of a misread or miscommunication by Weimer. Uh, we'll get to that a little later. Um, that would put two runners on. Uh Piamps would then uh, force Triolo to line out to right. That would move Taylor to third with two outs and clinging to a 3-2 lead. Then Andrew McCutcheon uh, comes to hit for Henry Davis. Piamps strikes him out to end the game. 3-2 Brewers win. Got a little hairy at the end, um, but they end up nailing it down. Uh, some composure um, from Piamps after uh, one self-inflicted wound and then uh, some trouble out in shallow left field. Yeah, do you, do you want me to circle back to the, the earlier play? Yeah, so there's a play earlier in the game. Um, Second inning and, play? Yes, and were there one or two outs when it happened? I, excuse me, I can't remember. I think there was uh, one out, actually, when it happened. Or mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm that's lost. right. But uh, from, from my memory, uh, that's right. Sal Freelick on third, Bryce Terang on first, William Contreras at the plate. Um Bryce Serang takes off to steal second, has it stolen easily, as is just what he does now. Uh, much like we saw a few weeks ago, where I believe it was Sal Freelich got called in a rundown between first and second, and Blake Perkins raced home to score. Sal took off from third, trying to score. Throw from second base is accurate and gets Freelich. Um, so not successful. They don't score a run in that inning, and William Contreras doesn't get a, a full chance with a runner on. Uh, first and third to kind of do some damage and what would have been uh, second and third with Terang successfully sealing the base. So that was uh, the, the setup there. So over to you. Yeah, I, I guess that was the play itself. And then I don't know if the quotes, because I don't know if this was kind of really made a feature of any article or reported out, but you can go and watch on Bally Sports Wisconsin's Twitter um, from this game, the, the post game availability with Murph. Um, really, really interesting few minutes towards the back end where he was asked about this. And again, as we mentioned, just incredibly open and candid. And um, honestly, what was most striking was he wanted to he wanted to teach, right? <laughs> he wanted to share the wisdom and explain and really make sure everyone had a clear understanding. And of course, you're talking to the journalists who were assembled and who cover your team throughout a year. Um, but also you're talking indirectly to the fans on that front. Um, so when a reporter, I'm not sure who it was, I don't know if it was a regular voice, maybe it was someone from the Pittsburgh side of things when he was asked about um, the decision there. He summed it up as really, it was just, look, it was a bad read. Um, but that's a, that is a play. That is that is essentially a core piece of the offense. You're gonna see it again throughout the season. Um, they work on it quite a lot, and it's the kind of thing where he just views it as fundamental that his team are going to be that aggressive in trying to get things going, trying to make things happen, and really just running the bases and stealing. There's something very unsavory when William Contreras is at the plate, and you've got you know, a guy in third base who gets caught stealing. It's you're like, geez, just give Bill a chance to, you know, pick up the RBI. I mean, he does it every time he gets a chance, basically. So why would you do anything else? I think the flip side of that is 
if the Brewers, let's say, get thirty situations this season where you've got Bryce Durang on first and Sal Freelick on third, I think that's going to come off quite a lot. I think with two guys like that, I mean, when Bryce is the guy on first, that is certainly going to open up the door for that. And then if it's someone like Sal at third, I, I, I was just, I was quite interested. Obviously, it didn't work. It looked quite dumb. And you go, oh, okay, that's not great. But again, given some added perspective as to it being something of a focus, being a play that the Brewers have real emphasis on. And I think with the personnel involved, it's it's intriguing, it's exciting, and I think it's something that would come off a lot of the time over the course of the season. Yeah, you'll have times where it doesn't work out, and this was certainly one of those. Um but I don't I don't hate the overall mindset here, even if I think in that moment, is it the best of the decisions? Probably not, but we may be building towards something bigger here. And just worth mentioning, um, Trey Turner caught stealing no longer the the leader in all baseball for, you know, consecutive steals without being caught. That is Bryce Terang. So yeah, I guess you gotta gotta really zero in and make sure you're using him as a weapon in all of the various ways you can and Part of that could be, yeah, the tread of Bryce and knowing he's fast enough to pull off what he needs to could certainly spring some of his teammates to steal home too. And I put Sal right up there as guys you'd be backing in that scenario. So just kind of interesting one to keep in mind and certainly look to as the season goes on. Uh, I'm going to push back on one thing you said in that uh, they could score on that a lot. I don't think they're going to because I think the scouting report for catchers now is going to say we don't sure, have a chance well, to catch a Bryce to well, That's well, that's the interesting thing on even just on Murph going and talking about it too, like which is great for us. We do a podcast. Um, it's also, I guess, great if you're an opposition scout for the Brewers. If every post game you can be like, he's going to give us something today. Like you know, it's there'll be something every day. It's it's interesting. I mean, I'm not saying Adam, he's giving away things that no one is going to pick up on, um, but still, most organizations would be like, hey, let's just guard everything we can. Let's not spell it out for them. Adam, we know what Pat Murphy does. That was intentional. He wants the pump fake uh, throws and the I'm cutoffs across again. the middle. I'm falling for it again. <laughs> I'm taking the man at his word. They're never going to try it again. Yeah, he, he's changing the scouting reports. And now they're just going to let Bryce steal if someone's on third base. They're not going to try it. Um, anyway, uh, not that he even needs the help. He's, he can do it all on his own. Uh, final game of the series, Mitch Keller on the mound against Freddie Peralta. And uh, started started great. Uh, William Contreras um, at the plate uh, in the first inning. Brushes a home run to left field. 448 feet uh, exit velocity of 114 miles per hour, which I think you said was uh, Same as Gary in Sanchez. line with Gary's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in line with Gary's uh, earlier homer. Um, William Contreras' line on the season, he would go two for four in this game. 365, 446, 573. If your stat line kind of scouting out your National League MVP um, race right now, it's William Contreras, Mookie Betts, and Shohei Otani based on offensive production. And that's insane that we're saying this about Bill, a guide that they got for SD Ruiz. And, and, and they got you all pie threw ups in, too. Yeah, threw in you all <laughs> pie ups, the man that would close the game today. Um, or I think he got the eight today, actually. Because um, it was Trevor McGill's first save, which we'll get to. Spoiler alert. Um, but I mean, like, the guy's just finding new ways to, um, to wow us. He stole a base in this game, Adam. Like, he's doing it all. I'm not. I'm not banging against uh, Bill finishing the season's NL MVP. I don't. I don't care who those names are. <laughs> um. Honestly, he just like what he's doing on a game to game basis is insane. Um. It's just. It's become so routine that it's. It's truly. It's stunning if he doesn't have a multi hit game. If he's not hitting for extra bases on a given night. All, all these kind of things are just really, really shocking. Um, all of that goes to just continuing to play very good defense. You know, we'll talk also about the other catcher and Gary Sanchez showed a little bit with his arm and his ab- ability to uh, try out runners in this series too. But I just like I, the whole package is there for Contreras. He is so, so, so good. 
Um, it, it's a real thrill to watch him. I'm genuinely, we talked about it last year and how he should have had some sort of place in like broader conversations as who's down, who's down the list a little bit, but worthy of mentions in an MVP discussion. I do not think he's going to be down any lists. He is going to be right there at the forefront. Um, and that is even with the potential of, you know, a, a brewer's tax of, oh, guy who plays in Milwaukee and it might be easier to ignore him compared to uh, your Mookie Betts, your Shahitani's, but no, uh, Gary's not even not even Gary, although Gary will get to him in a second. But Bill's play is um it's certainly demanding that people sit up and take notice if they weren't already. Unfortunately, early in this game for the Brewers, uh, Freddy Peralta, it, it was apparent from the get-go that he did not have it. Um, this looked like one of the Freddy Peralta games from, I uh, can't think of what month, maybe May or June of last season, where he was struggling with the walks and had no command. No command or control in this game. Wasn't hitting his spots in the zone, was way out of the zone in places, and it was the first truly poor performance of the season for Freddy Peralta, he'd tell you. The same thing. Uh, starts off the game by striking out Andrew McCutcheon. Brian Reynolds in the bottom of the first follows that with a single to center. Uh, walks Rowdy Telez. And then Joey Bart homers to left um, to met, or to center field, excuse me, um, to make it 3-1. to one. Yeah, it was more right center. I've got the replay right here playing in my brain. Uh, makes it 3-1 after um, the bottom of the first. Mitch Keller didn't look great for the Pirates either. So the Brewers were most certainly not out of this baseball game. Uh, in the third inning, uh, Sal Freelick leads off with a walk. Contreras draws a walk of his own. After an Adama strikeout, uh, Jake Bowers' ground ball single through the right side scores Freelick, makes it 3-2 and puts Contreras on third. Uh, then Reese Hoskins hits a line drive into right field. Brian Reynolds makes a diving attempt but is not able to come up with it. William Contreras scores. That makes it 3-3. Uh, Oliver Dunn flies out the center, and then Blake Perkins strikes out to end the rally. In the fifth, Brewers rallying again against uh, Mitch Keller. William Contreras singles to right. The man um, that crushes 114-mile-per-hour exit velocity uh, homers also just goes the opposite way for a single when, when that's what's uh, when that's what's available to him. He's just – the versatility as a hitter is another thing that just is something that's really impressive um, from William Contreras. Uh, after a Willie Adamas pop-out, uh, Contreras would then steal second, like I had mentioned earlier. Jake Bauer strikes out, and then Reese Hoskins hits a line drive into left field. Jack Sawinski lays out, makes the catch, but the mm -hmm. ball comes out of his glove. Uh, Hoskins uh, reaches second with the double. Contreras scores. That makes it 4-3. Reese, <laughs> Reese gets to first base, and is just like really pissed. He's like, uh, uh, he's got it, and then suddenly sees that the ball's on the ground and springs into action, and the, the man does not move well, so he had to uh, motor on down to second and slide in there safe for his double. Um, but anyway, that would Bring the Brewers ahead four to three. Peralta in the bottom of the fifth uh, would give it right back um, after getting Brian Reynolds to dry, uh, to ground out and striking out Rowdy Telez. Two outs in the fifth. Uh, Joey Bart walks. Jack Sawinski crushes a double off the top of the wall, scoring Bart to make it four four. Triolio singles to right to score Sawinski, makes it five four. Pirates. Hobie Milner then strikes out O'Neill Cruz um, to end the threat. Yeah, tough day for Freddie. When he just didn't have it, this is something that we had come to expect from him intermittently um, throughout various seasons. Um, it becomes harder on pitching staff when he is um, your ace rather than your number three starter. Um, but yeah, not I'm not overly concerned by any means against Freddie, but today was just not good. Not good. Um, very concerning and, you know, quite jarring when it's as bad as this, just because not only are we getting used to something different, but they just can't afford it. Um, they did a pretty good job, though, of taking a, a really rough star from Freddie and running with it. Look, I'll, I'll also give him some credit in a day where he didn't quite have it. He basically gets through five innings. I mean, that's that's the key here. Um, if Freddie at any point this season is getting knocked out of a game, like, truly very early that will create a whole chain reaction down the rest of the brewers rotation for a week but 
if it's going to happen, I guess at least it happened on a day where some offense was found. Offense was found indeed, Adam. Um, yeah, Milner gets the strikeout of Cruz to get out of that inning. Uh, Abner Uribe comes on next, strikes out the side, 12 pitches, nine for strikes, just like hammering sliders in there and just making guys uh, look foolish. I thought it was uh, maybe, uh, I'm probably missing something, but one of the better Abner Uribe outings of the season. I mean, three strikeouts swinging uh, when you're getting guys to, to swing and miss like that to get your way out of an, an inning. Uh, yeah, that'll play. Good to see from Abner um, there. Uh, the Brewers would also turn to Jared Koenig again. He would provide a scoreless inning, worked around two hits and a walk. And then the Brewers uh, still down 5-4 in the eighth inning uh, would have a little bit of fun. Aroldis Chapman on the mound for the Pirates again. Uh, Blake Perkins would reach on an infield single. Joey Ortiz then pinch hits for Bryce Terang. Uh Joey Ortiz grounds out to third. Uh, Joey Weimer then follows that with a strikeout. Uh, Gary Sanchez pinch hits for Sal Freelich. Quickly goes down 0-2 before taking what I believe on the stadium gun registered as a 102-mile-per-hour fastball out to right field. Two-run homer uh, gives the Brewers the lead 6-5 uh, to five at that point. But Gary Sanchez with a, a flair for the dramatic there and just uh, – Baseball comes in hard. Baseball goes out hard in that scenario. Just crushed the opposite field homer, um, which was great to see. He's all gas, no breaks, uh, Gary Sanchez, when he swings that bat. Truly. I mean, I don't think you can get any more all gas, no breaks, I believe. Is he now um, seven hits for the season? Yeah, three of which are home runs, which is just it is, and it's like three doubles too, funny. I think, right? <laughs> um, one double. He does have uh, a couple okay. of walks too. You know, he's not a one trick pony. He can show some plate discipline and you know just stroll on up to to first base. But um, yeah, just again, overall, like, are we going to be like, oh yeah, he's getting on base all the time? He's just got a really beautiful OPS. Maybe he will. Maybe. Maybe he's just going to slug so hard that his OPS will be fine. But God, is it fun to watch him just take an almighty swing at a ball. And it's yielding pretty good results. Like, again, I think what he is, what he brings to the Brewers can only be measured within the context of what we just talked about Contreras doing. Like, this is your backup catcher. I mean, one of my things, though, when you're looking at some of these lineups and you're playing matchups and you're trying to work out, okay, what are you going to do? Right now, you want to try and find every opportunity you can to get Gary Sanchez in games. Um, I like seeing him get in as a pinch hitter here and have some success because you just, you've got to get him at bats. Like you just can't, you can't leave this guy as out of the mix as really he was for a large part early on. But it seems like, yeah, if he continues having home runs like he is, the Brewers will make sure that's rectified. Yoel Piams comes on for the Brewers in the bottom of the eighth and pitches around a O'Neill Cruz double and a walk to Andrew McCutcheon to get out of the inning. After the Cruz double, gets a pop out to second from Michael A. Taylor. Williams lines out to the center. Then the McCutcheon walk comes in, and then Brian Reynolds grounds out to Jake Bowers at first base. Um, this was the play that... Uh, Bowers made the tough kind of spinning hop, um, I think. So big play to get out of the inning there after the uh, poor defensive play in game one. Uh, in the top of the ninth, Rones and Contreras comes on for Pittsburgh. Willie Adamas draws a leadoff walk. Jake Bowers singles to center to put himself and Willie Adamas on base. Uh, after Reese Hoskins fly out to right, Oliver Dunn, ground ball single to right. Scores Willie Adamas makes it 7-5. Uh, Blake Perkins uh, reaches on an infield single to load the bases. Then uh, Joey Ortiz, fly ball to right field. Uh, Brian Reynolds uh, guns down Jake Bowers at the plate. Uh, on to the ninth, Trevor McGill on, gets a Connor Joe fly out, a Joey Bart ground out, and then a Jack Sawinski fly out. One, two, three, ninth for Trevor McGill for his first career save. Great stuff from the big guy. Brewers split the series, salvage the series, winning the final two games. The record is 16-8 and eight, um, as we leave Pittsburgh. And four-game series there, Adam, have... Have some bad memories for me, so I, I'm I'm 
as much as I want to go visit the park, I'm per- I've heard it's beautiful. You know, not mad to be uh, leaving Pittsburgh. No, not mad. And look, the Brewers remain, albeit with a narrow lead over Craig Council's Chicago Cubs. Um, they remain leaders in the NL Central. They remain right up there with the very best teams in all of baseball. And they're just a half game back of the opponent that they will be facing next in a series coming up at Anfam. Yeah, the Houston Astros are a disgrace, Adam. Um, it's yeah, not just good the, behavior. The, I mean, you feel really you needed to get that off your chest. It's seven and nineteen for the Astros is an abomination, considering you know what their roster looks like and what they've done in recent years. But look, there's a lot of seasons yet left. You know, maybe by you calling them out, Andrew, you can you can spark something. I I, I don't want to spark something because I wanted it this week against the Cubs. And their <laughs> disgraces. Um. Through 24 games, let's hand out some beers. Uh, Wood, William Contreras, no surprise, tops this board, gets two beers for the series. Bryce Terran gets a beer. Gary Sanchez gets a beer. Reese Hoskins gets a beer. Joe Ross gets a beer. Tobias Myers gets a beer. Joel Piamps gets a beer. Trevor McGill gets a beer. Tiago Vieira gets a beer. Abner Uribe gets a beer. Brian Hudson gets a beer. And Elvis Peguero gets a beer. Leaderboard through 24 games. William Contreras with 10. Bryce Terang with 7. Willie Dom as Abner Uribe and Brian Hudson with 6. Chris Yelich and Joel Piamps with 5. Jackson Chorio, Joey Ortiz, Colin Ray, Reese Hoskins, Elvis Peguero with four. South Freak, Blake Perkins, Freddie Peralta, Hobie Milner, Bryce Wilson, Joe Ross, Thiago Vieira with three. Oliver Dunn, Gary Sanchez, Trevor McGill with two. Jake Bowers, J.B. Bukowskis, Jared Koenig, Joey Weimer, Owen Miller, and Tobias Myers each have one. That brings us to the series ahead. The Milwaukee Brewers will return home, whereas you correctly pointed out earlier in the podcast, they have not spent a lot of time there. Uh, Friday, April 26th. 7-10 Central start, Colin Ray against Louise Hill. Uh, Sunday, April 27th, uh, 6-10 Central start, Joe Ross against Carlos Rodon. And Sunday, April 28th, uh, 1-10 Central start, uh, was it Bryce Wilson against Marcus Stroman? Is that right? Uh, uh, ESPN is was... as, as blank. I saw, give me one moment. Sophia Minner definitely tweeted out. Yeah, um, that's what, what I was. The next tree we're gonna be. So, that third slot is going to belong to wait Tobias Myers. Tobias Myers. Tobias sorry. Myers. Yeah, that's who we're. Forgetting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tobias Myers. I uh, sorry for forgetting you, Tobias. After handing you a beer, that's on me. Um, like you said, sixteen and eight Brewers in first place, half game ahead of the Cubs. Yankees have had a good start to the season as well, and should be a fun time at Amfam. Like. If you're local, unlike me and Adam, <laughs> go spend a weekend. For sure. I think that'll do it for now. As always, make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. So you're up to date on every brewery series throughout the season. That's cruising for bruising. You should also check out the rest of the GSPN shows. We've got the Eurostep Podcast Network for all things Milwaukee books. As we record this, the books are tied at one game apiece with the Indiana Pacers heading to Indianapolis. Big game tree coming up on Friday night. Will the Annals be back anytime soon? We shall see. For all things books, Eurostep Podcast Network. After every game, full breakdowns, analysis, lots of stuff thrown in there in the mix in between it. You'll be covered from all angles for all things books. For... All things Green Bay Packers, and for all of your draft coverage, I mean, as we're recording now, the draft is ongoing. Um, Jordan Tresky, Numac, Talk of the Tundra. That's where you want to go to get all things Packers on the draft. Jordan and Numac will have all the ins and outs on all decisions the Packers make. And last but not least, for movies and pop culture and all that kind of stuff, make time for this. Our latest episode should be up on the same day this goes out on Alex Garland's Civil War. Um, plans for the next episode on Luca Guadagnino's Challengers. Lots of interest to you. Check out next time for this. Until next time, thanks again to all of you for listening. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Adam.